The, the outline that I'm kind of following through this will be, first off, the shepherd's responsibility to the sheep. And we find that in verse 12. And we'll begin looking at that today. And then again, uh, next willing, uh, we'll, Lord willing, we'll be looking at the shepherd's responsibility to the sheep. The sheep's responsibility to the shepherd. And then the spiritual condition of the sheep. And depending upon time, there's also the sheep's responsibility to the great shepherd. If you would uh, stand with me uh, out of honor for God's word as we read this passage together. So you follow along. If you do not have a Bible with you, uh, we have the text up on the screens. And if you need a Bible, uh, let us know. We'll be happy to, to get one. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. He says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and, do not, uh, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. I pray that the Lord will begin to make us more aware of the relationships that he's laid out here to make sure that we have a healthy flock. You may be seated. The first part of this passage is dealing with the shepherd's responsibility to the sheep and, and there are three areas that that this text speaks to one is to um, the responsibility to labor we also see the responsibility of the shepherd to exercise authority and then lastly the responsibility of the shepherd to provide instruction it's been said that there is nothing more devastating to the spiritual progress of a church than an unho un unwholesome relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd must fulfill his responsibility and the sheep must fulfill their responsibility to the shepherd. This is where the health of the church resides. In verse 12 it says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. The, the way this sentence is, is structured, it's structured as a request. We ask, we request of you, brothers. This is like a request from a friend, a request to continue on to do better. We urge you. This is a, a general call to live obediently to the instructions given by the apostles in the name of the Lord. So we begin this section with a request. We ask you, brothers. The first responsibility that the shepherd has to the sheep is the responsibility to labor. Verse 12 says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you. To respect literally means to know, and it also means to identify or to take note of. The second description here means to esteem. So in combination, these two clauses exhort the church to acknowledge and respect those who minister in their midst. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of, the, of their way of life and imitate their faith. So this means that people uh, are to know their pastor. 
well enough to have an appreciation for him and to respect him because of his value. So the, the question begs to be answered, how well do you know your pastor? If we are to respect those who work hard among us, we are to know them. So what makes Brother Bill tick? What makes him happy? What grieves him? Now, if you are a part of his family, you may already know those answers, right? Because you've lived with him or around him. But for the rest of us, in order for us to respect in this way the one who stands before us, the one who we are to know, how well do we know him? What does he appreciate? Where does he struggle? What makes him tick? How can you encourage him in the faith? This is our responsibility. And I, I can't draw any direct parallels here, but in my mind, it's, I've been commanded to know my wife, to know how she ticks, to be able to to minister to her and to love her and, and to encourage her with the washing of the word over her. <laughs> and, and in my mind, I kind of have this same idea that I, I need to know my pastor. Maybe not as well as I would know my wife, but I need to know my pastor. How, how can I accurately respect him and help him and encourage him and, and make this uh, area of ministry not to be any more burdensome than it would have to be? How well do I know him? The work of pastors is summarized in kind of a threefold description, which includes laboring or working to the point of exhaustion, overseeing, which literally means uh, standing before the flock to lead them in the way of righteousness, and then third, instructing the truths of God's word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28 says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this, of this ministry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is the result of the labor, to present us mature in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would want that job. I know me. <laughs> and sometimes I have received instruction fairly well. <laughs> and sometimes I have not received instruction very well. And Josh made a, a great connection here with my relationship to God and my relationship to my pastor. If my relationship to my Lord is not what it is supposed to be, there's no way that my relationship with my pastor and my wife and anyone else can be what it needs to be. So this is an astounding goal, to teach and admonish with all wisdom to present every man complete in Christ. In order to do this, Paul would have to pour out his life into them. And this is the labor that a pastor is called to. Never having a set schedule for anything. <laughs> because you, you never know. What's going to happen? You never know who may call. You never know when someone may need someone to come alongside them. The church was to take note of those who worked hard and those who are over you and those who, <clears throat> who admonish you. Paul apparently listed these three, laboring and leading and admonishing, as kind of typical things that a minister would do. These are part of ministry functions. All of these descriptions are in the present tense, implying that they're kind of habitually the characteristic of one who leads. These persons are not sporadic. 
but constant laborers in the congregation. And again, my mind went back to the hireling who when the, when the lives of the sheep are in danger, they would flee. Not so with this minister. Not so with this labor. Staying. Continuing to work to mature the saints. Paul could have provided a much longer list and detailed into various ministry functions or positions. I mean, he did in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and also in Ephesians. But he's focused on these three things. First, the responsibility to labor. Second, the responsibility to exercise authority. In verse 12 again, it says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord. Those who are over you translates a compound word that literally means to stand before. In general, it does not depict an office, but a task. Standing before isn't to be a title in this context. It is to describe the labor. The one who stands before you in Paul's letters is both a leader and a caregiver. It means that they take charge over you in the Lord. They lead and direct. They have delegated authority by Christ, spiritual wisdom, guidance, protection, direction, generally responsible for the health of the church. And notice the phrase, in the Lord. This charge is not from men. They are called and they are equipped by God. Their authority is from God. This oversight is an amazing responsibility. Next week, if the Lord lets us meet again, we'll delve a little bit more into this idea of exactly what does that mean. Paul attempted to provide a model for the church to follow, and he praised the Thessalonians for doing the same in chapter 1 and verse 7. Elsewhere, Timothy and Titus were encouraged to lead by example. This combining of terms working hard and admonishing indicates that Paul was not describing something that, again, that would be a position, but it, it would be something that depicted leadership. Again, another amazing task to be the example for the flock. The third thing that we see in verse 12 is the responsi responsibility to provide instruction. In verse 12 it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord that as you has re have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know that you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord. This Admonish is an instruction with a view of correction. And no doubt, you've experienced this with your children, or you have experienced it as a child. Instruction with a view of correction. With a view of changing the sheep to where they see what they ought to be, where they see where they are and then begin to move in the direction toward where they ought to be. Another wonderful job that I would not want. How willing am I to change? Yet another responsibility of this one who leads. How well do I take instruction with a view of correction? Because I'm not where I need to be. 
And this leadership role is to be able to take and, and analyze a situation and understand where a person is and see where they need to be according to God's word and, and begin encouraging and admonishing them to be there. teaching with an element of warning, correction, channeling them toward holy living from those things that will hurt them toward those things that will bless them. The phrase admonish you or instruct you is to put into your minds good and wholesome things. It cannot be done without regular preaching from the word. It just can't. And how blessed we are to have faithful teaching from the Word. Day in and day out, week in and week out. Our pastor is faithful to do that. We're also to receive these good and wholesome things that are put into our minds, the doctrines of the gospel, the duties of religion, and the warning of sin and danger. And reprove and rebuke with faithfulness. How would you like to have that as a task list week in and week out? to reprove and rebuke with faithfulness. And as the case requires, either in public or in private, with sharpness or with tenderness. Why? Titus chapter 1 verse 9 tells us, so that they, may, so that they can hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the doctrine, so they can teach the truth both to those who do the truth and those who err. Skill in applying the word to build you up by the word. This is the responsibility of the shepherd to the sheep. John MacArthur has said that no king, no president or politician, no judge or military commander has such an awesome responsibility as the one who shepherds the sheep by giving the instruction out of the Word of God. So the work of the shepherd is to work among you, to have authority over you, and to lead you in the path that God has designed for you. And next week, we'll take a look at the sheep's responsibility to the shepherd and the spiritual condition of the sheep. Let's pray.